Okay. Let's get this show going. I don't want to talk too long. It's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Lacey. We've been working at Ball. I don't know when did you come to Ball, Paul. 28 years ago. 28 years ago. I worked there 27 years since 1978. And Paul is truly one of the giants in system and optical engineering for high tech science, cameras, optical instruments, telescopes, and fly in space. He's a few, he's one of a handful of people that can design and then later on so implement these kind of state of the art instruments. A lot of the pictures that you see on the internet or in the uh, publications that NASA puts out on galaxies, nebulas, clusters, all kinds of new discoveries is because of people like Paul and companies like Paul Aerospace that make that possible. We have really a great honor to have him here tonight. And he's going to talk to us about James Webb and a little bit on Hubble as well, I think, right? Mm -hmm. All pictures of Hubble, stuff like that. But mostly the James Webb Space Telescope, the follow on to the Hubble mission, to look even further back in time until whenever. So, with that, Dr. Paul I see. Okay. See you a little better yes, in the light, in the spotlight. For any of the kids of any age who want to move up here, there's lots of empty seats up here. If you want yeah. to roll around, the there's room on the floor. You're welcome to you move up any time. Just kind of do it real quiet. So, what brings us here tonight? Well, astronomy, the study of objects we see in the sky at night, well beyond the Earth. But what's really of interest is astrophysics, and that's where we interpret the positions of the objects and the nature of the light or the radiation, recommended radiation that we get from those objects to understand both what and where they are. And so what are those objects? Well, I think most of you are familiar, but we can start out looking at the things closest to us. We'll be looking at the solar system. Then we go to our local galaxy, <coughs> the Milky Way. The sun sits down about this far from the center of the Milky Way. And it's only one of over you know, 10 billion, you know, 100 billion stars. <coughs> but we move on, and as we've moved on with uh, bigger and better telescopes, we start looking way beyond our own local galaxies to the galaxies beyond. And the real exciting Revelations that have come about in the past 10 to 20 years and few. Oh, yes. I thought I had a rich, rich hand. Oh, they are passing it around. So, anyway. It's been the idea of looking at microwave radiation coming from the very earliest parts of, of the visible part of the universe, the, the cosmic microwave background. So what tools can we use to look at the sky? Well, the early, early uh, people, yes. <coughs> yes. But what I'm going to talk about is sort of how did we develop in time? You know, early people just gazed at the nighttime sky, but they, but they also had some interesting tools. Uh, you've heard of the Stonehenge, calendric formations, but also uh, astrolabe and the idea of quadrants to measure the stars. And this probably culminated before telescopes with what Tycho Brahe was able to do, first with a large quadrant mural, uh, mural quadrant, but also this idea of, of the what was called equatorial armillary, and that's the first <coughs> instrument that really is like our modern day telescopes on an equatorial mount. 
for doing it. But he still is using just the human eye to line, but doing the very careful measurements that allowed uh, Kepler to resolve something called the Copernican Mars catastrophe. Because Copernicus assumed things were all in circles and not on the ellipses. But then Galileo came along and introduced the telescope. So now we start having a major change in technology. But really for astronomy, we can quickly jump past Galileo. We really sort of start with Newton. Sure. Because it was the all-reflecting telescope is what allows us to exploit, quote, the broad spectrum. All colors of light reflect off the mirror the same. So you don't get any color distortion. Where when you use refractive optics, you have to pay a lot of really high expensive money, like a pair of binoculars, to get them achromatic, to get them to not have color distortion. Because the refraction through the glass is different for different colors. So we really take advantage of that with, with mirrors. And also, you can go to large sizes. With a, a refractive telescope, the typical objective, fat in the center and thin at the edges for a lens. If you get very big, you have too much mass of glass in the center to be supported out on the thin edges. So the largest refractive telescope is a 40-inch telescope at Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin. Reflective mirrors, we can go very large. Ground-based telescopes, we now have 10 meter, 30 feet, 30 plus foot. So telescope makes far off objects seem closer and larger. The large apertures gather more light to detect fainter objects. So we don't have to just rely on how much light can get through the pupil of our eye, but we can collect large amounts of eye light and concentrate it and then look at it. Whoops. So this just shows examples of large telescopes. We can start here. The Thompson, but also I'll talk about it. Keck, which is a 10 meter type of telescopes in a way, but also the Hubble Space Telescope. <clears throat> well, I want to talk then why do we go to space? And Lyman and Spitzer, people had speculated on doing astronomy space, but Lyman and Spitzer really did the seminal work back in 1946 on the advantages of doing astronomy from space. And but really, the culmination of his early work really was the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA has a policy that they will not name an observatory after somebody who is still alive. And Spitzer was alive and there for the launch of Hubble. Otherwise, it probably would have been named after him. He did die later, a few years later, and so Ball built this the Space Infrared Telescope Facility. We built the telescope for that and a couple of the instruments. That did get named in honor of Spitzer, so we had a Spitzer <coughs> sort of But he really did the, the work that really promoted and got things moving about the idea and the advantages of doing it in space. Well, we've taken that culmination of Hubble, and we're now proposing something even grander, but to go beyond it with the James Webb Space Telescope. So why space? One of the major advantages of doing astronomy from space is when you're on the ground, if you look across all the different colors in the spectrum, our eyes are only sensitive to this region right in here, where I show the, the spectrum. But, but once you get to shorter wavelengths in the ultraviolet, the atmosphere just absorbs all that light. So all the UV light coming from space never makes it to the ground. And even out into the infrared, about half of it doesn't make it to the ground, and there's more large regions out here. If you go to space, this whole thing would be solid white. You see all that light. So, so you have the advantage of being able to see physical phenomena taking place that produces light of all different colors from space, and you can't see that from the ground. Also, you get sharper images. The atmosphere has little inhomogeneities in the refraction of the gas, the nitrogen and the oxygen. And so it causes stars to twinkle. We get scintillation from here. And that it really restricts how well we can get diffraction images to look at very faint, small objects. 
but also that same black stuff that absorbs energy and doesn't let it get down to the ground means that it's also acting as a black body radiator. And so when you look through the atmosphere, there's a certain amount of infrared glow that's fluctuating just from the atmosphere. So you get more unwanted background stray light from the gas. So this is the, the level of glow that you would get from the atmosphere. If we go to space, for James Webb, we're looking at getting things much, you know, factors of a hundred lower in terms of background, you know, unwanted glow that we're trying to look through. So it's, I use the analogy, it's, it's like draw, driving on a foggy night with, you know, headlights coming towards you. All that fog, you get all this diffuse glow. We're trying to get rid of that. So why James Webb? What are we planning to do? What is the, the, the science mission? And we can sort of group it as being search for origins, but it's grouped into four major categories. And the real uh, one that catches everybody's eye and the reason that some people call the James Webb Space Telescope the first light machine is because we want to look for the first light and reionization of the universe. And I'll talk about that a little more in just a second. But we also want to look at the assembly of galaxies. We want to look so far back and further out to try to see some of the earliest galaxies as they were forming. See if we can understand the physical processes that were taking place for the formation of these early galaxies. We can also start looking at the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems. And some of that will be looking at things closer in our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, tonight they were looking at uh, the the nebula in Orion, and I'll show some pictures later, but it, it's, a, it's a nursery birth ground for the formation of stars. So trying to understand the birth of stars and the protoplanetary systems that form around those stars. Some of that can be done from things closer by. And finally, looking at those planetary systems and the origin of life. We'll have enough resolution and enough sensitivity to try to look near a star and look and detect the planets and actually detect enough of the spectrum to start doing chemical assays of their atmospheres. So we can try to understand what their atmospheres are in, in, in the atmospheres. Well, let me talk a little bit about the, a brief history of time and the first light machine. <clears throat> Many of you may be familiar with the idea of the, the Big Bang, you know, that, that the universe uh, cre was created at a singularity instant in time and actually in the first something like 10 to the minus 15 seconds, faster than anything that we really can easily time, is you have what's called the inflationary period. You have sudden inflation. The universe finally got big enough to low enough energy density. All that energy of the whole universe inside this very confined area got large enough that it, quote, froze out the fundamental forces of nature. So at the end of three seconds of the universe, we then have the fundamental forces of electricity and magnetism, nuclear weak interaction, nuclear strong interaction, and gravity. And they behaving as different forces. But the main universe at that three seconds old, it was mostly protons, electrons, and alpha particles as far as the particles that have mass. Now there's a lot of dark energy, there's a lot of dark matter. But the matter that we can detect and understand, it consisted of protons, electrons, and alpha particles. But they were so high energy, they couldn't stick together, pull together. And so it was a hot, glowing plasma, similar to looking at the surface of the sun. And that hot, glowing plasma expanded for 400,000 years. By the time the universe had expanded for 400,000 years, the energy density got low enough that the temperature wasn't so high, that, that that electron was finally going slow enough when it went by the proton, the proton, positively charged, electron negatively charged, could reach out and grab it and say, hey, let's square dance together. <laughs> and so now you can start getting the electrons and protons coming together to form neutral hydrogen. And two electrons binding to the alpha particles, and you have helium. So most of the universe during this region went dark. It became cold, neutral gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. What we're looking for is when did 
that uniform gas not being perfectly uniform. So if you have local areas where the little bit gas was sort of concentrated, the gravity of all those particles for each other would cause the local cloud to start falling in on itself and condense and become and compress. Well, if you compress gas, what happens? It gets hot. Eventually, it'll get hot enough that those proton or those hydrogen atoms colliding with each other bounce off and they break apart, and those electrons can't hang on to the protons anymore, and you start getting plasma. But you can actually get hot enough to overcome the electron magnetic repulsion between the two protons such that they'll get close enough <coughs> that the nuclear strong force takes over and you get fusion you have stars. And so we're looking at that reionization of the universe which took place somewhere between 400,000 years and something up on the order of 1 billion years. Hubble has been able to see back in time to about 13 billion years. We want to see that distance from 13 billion down to 13.4 you know, or so to detect that first one. I will just happen to throw in here a little bit of synergy. I said the other mission was protoplanetary, you know, looking at planets. Well, we get a little synergy between efforts that we've done at Ball. Some of you may have heard of Kepler and the Kepler mission which is now, uh, has detected over 2,740 planet candidates. Uh, I have 122 confirmed, but I haven't kept up with it. It's, I think it's more, quite a bit more than that now. Uh, what will happen is James Webb will be able to go back and look at these uh, planets that were discovered by Kepler, but with greater resolution and the ability to look and detect and start making measurements of what kind of atmospheres do they have, that kind of information. So let me move on to saying, well, what do we need James Webb? How do we construct it? What do we do? What are the properties of this observatory that's going to do the mission I just described? Well, basically, the, the science goals really push the spectral domain into the infrared. And that's basically due to the large redshifts. I didn't mention that, but as we look back in time, since the universe is expanding, the further we look back, the further things are, are away from us. And the further they are away from us, the faster they are moving away from us, and so you get a what's called a Doppler shift. So if I look at emission from a hydrogen atom in the laboratory, it might be something called the Lyman alpha line, which is ultraviolet. But if that is moving away from me at very high speed, that ultraviolet gets shifted to the red. And so a lot of the hydrogen spectroscopy you would do in the lab here on Earth, the, where you would be looking at UV and short visible wavelengths, you need to be looking out in the infrared to see that same chemis chemistry taking place. And so we really want to go to large redshifts. Also, this idea of looking at planets <coughs> and the planetary stuff, that I mentioned is infrared is very interesting is because it, 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 it penetrates, and admittedly, the universe isn't a black plastic bag. But this shows the example. In the visible, you just see the person standing there with a black plastic bag over his arm. If you're in the infrared, you see right through the black plastic bag. You see it. I like to show the, the analogy of how that shows up in real astronomy. This is two pictures taken with Hubble instruments. This is the wide field planetary camera taken in the visible of that middle blob in the three stars that are in the dagger of Orion, the Orion Nebula. And it's just, you see all this light being scattered and it just looks like a bright cloud, a nebula. That's what we're going to say. But if you look in the infrared, and why don't you look at this little pattern here, is this is a mosaic of images taken with the NICMOS instrument that was on Hubble. That was, made, that was in, in the infrared. And you look at that same region, and now with infrared, you can see a wealth of stars, these new stars that are being formed inside that gas cloud. So, again, a region for doing the infrared. Now, I mentioned the redshift and looking far away. The further away something is, the dimmer it gets. So, if I'm going to see it, what do I have to do? 
I've got to collect more light. So I need very big aperture. James Webb will have a 24 or a 25 square meter collecting area. And when we do collect that light, we don't want to lose it because we have poor transmission. You know, our mirrors don't reflect very well. So we, we work to push very hard to make sure we have very high reflectance on, on the system so that we don't throw any of those photons away. I might mention that we will be looking at, we will be detecting sources where over that 25 square meter aperture, that's about a 21 foot diameter, think of it as a 21 foot for the purposes of here, you can think of it as a circle. That big area will be collecting one photon of light from the star that we're looking at every 30 seconds. So we plan to be integrating for four, five, ten hours of collecting these photons coming in so slow that you have time to name them. <laughs> <laughs> to create the images that we will be looking for. I might mention that sensitivity in the infrared, it would be the equivalent of being able to look at the moon and detect the heat given off by a bumblebee, if you could imagine a bumblebee somehow could survive a little <laughs> while we were here on Earth. In other words, looking from Earth to be able to resolve and see a bumblebee flying around and detect what its body temperature is because of the infrared radiation from its body. Well, the resulting solution, since we want to do all this, is there are certain things you want to do about that observatory. One is, if we're working in the infrared, we don't want our optics to be glowing. Infrared comes from the natural glow. You and I, we're at about 300 Kelvin. You know, some of you think it's 98.6 Fahrenheit. Some people think 37 Celsius. I like to think 310 Kelvin. Okay. Uh, but at 310 Kelvin, the wavelength of light that you most dominant wavelength of light that you glow at is about 10 microns. And where are we going to be working? We're going to be working from 6 to 30 microns. So we can't have our telescope glowing at room temperature, so we need to cool that telescope down to very cold temperatures. So we will be operating with mirror temperatures on the order of 50 Kelvin. That's below the freezing point of nitrogen. It'll be, I mean, the liquefaction point of nitrogen. It will be colder than liquid nitrogen. To do that, we, uh, yeah, I, I To do that, one of the, we'll be going to an orbit, something called the L2 orbit, out past the moon. And the reason there is because we can build a large sun shield with a block from the heat from the sun so that the observatory will only see cold space all the time and as a result cool off and get to those low temperatures. That sun shield, by the way, if you put on sun block, you have, you know, we have 30 SPF, 50 SPF. The SPF rating for that sun shield is about 10, about 10 to 15 million SPF. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bottle that? Pardon? Did you bottle that up? Can you and rub it on? Yeah. So anyway, just to show you the comparison of, of the years, uh, we've talked a lot about Hubble and now James Webb. This is a person, this is the size of the Hubble primary here which is a little bit more than the height of a person. Sorry about that. So there's the height of the person. There's the Hubble mirror, which is a little bit more. And then for comparison, this is how big the James Webb Now to show, just for comparison, I tried to take two pictures, and I tried to make sure that I adjusted the pictures on the, on the PowerPoint to have the same scale. So these people are roughly the same size, and this just gives you an idea. This is only six of the 18 segments of the primary mirror for Hubble. There's the full primary, I mean that's the full primary Hubble, and this is six of the segments for James Webb, just to give you a sense of scale. 
Well, focal plane technology, grabbing all those photons, seeing very faint objects. It's interesting to just sort of look back at the history of how well we've improved over what you can see with just the human eye. And just that first telescope, that little telescope that Galileo had, got you well over a factor of 10 of, of improvement in the faintness of objects that you could see. So with your naked eye, you don't see the four moons of Jupiter. Galileo, just that extra bit was enough. He could see the four faint moons of, of four of the four of the faint <laughs> moons of Jupiter. Uh, but then by building bigger, uh, we're going to hope both the, the concentration of the eyepiece on the telescope, but also building bigger telescopes just kept improving. You know, you have the Mount Wilson 100 inch, and I'm I'm old enough, I can remember growing up as a kid thinking, boy, the biggest and best thing around was the 200 inch Mount Palomar. You know, and that got us to about there. Also about that time, about my, my age, is when we started realizing instead of just relying on the eyeball, looking through an eyepiece, was the idea of using photographic film, that way you could use time exposure. So it wasn't just whether you could detect the brightness that was hitting your eyeball at the instant, but you could collect light over a long period of time, time exposure, and improve with the top photographic capabilities. Then along came the technology of electronic focal planes. Uh, charge couple devices, and then eventually uh, we use CMOS technology. So all of that is improved, and then by the time we get up to the James Webb, take 10 times 10 times 10, and repeat that. 10 times. That's how much improvement in sensitivity that we will have compared to the human eye. Well, where is this L2 point that I'm talking about? It's the Lagrange libration point. Lagrange worked out the mathematics for a three-body problem in many years ago. But it's a unique point sitting about one and a half billion kilometers beyond the Earth from the Sun. So it's about a hundredth of the distance from the sun to the earth, and it's about a hundredth further, so it's about one percent further. But what's unique about it is the mass of the earth combined with the mass of the sun is just enough to make the, the mass that holds a satellite to go around the sun, makes it think it's going around a sun that's a little bit more massive, and so it goes at the same speed as it would if it was in at the orbit of the earth, even though it's further out. The further out you go, the slower you go around the central object if you're just worrying about a standard satellite. But with the two together, it goes at the same speed. That makes it nice for doing an observatory because it's always at the same place. It doesn't get further away. It doesn't get closer. It stays at the same place and it just goes with us all through the year. So, of course, yeah. so it, it makes it the facility of having ground communications, Downloading data, everything else is very simple if you stay within a, a, a normal like that. It'll have a view, it'll be just like when you're here on Earth in the ground, you can only look at the sky during the night. You can't look at the sky that's overhead during the daytime. Well, we'll be in the same way. We have to look away from that sun shield. But over the period of a year, we'll see the whole celestial sphere and things up near the, like the the North Pole, no matter what night of the year when you go outside, you can see the North Pole. You can't always see Orion, but you can always see the North Pole. Well, the same thing. We will, the, the ecliptic poles will see, we can, can see continuously. But even the things down near the ecliptic plane, you'll have over 200 days. We'll have over half a year uh, availability for study. Well, what do we do with instruments? We're going to use different types of instruments to gather this electromagnetic radiation and try to understand it, the astrophysics. And what we have is a series of instruments that we share the field of view. Photons are precious. We don't want a beam splitter that takes that light that comes in and throw half, the in half of that light to one instrument and the other half to the other one. We don't know. We want all the light on one instrument at a time, and then we'll change the pointing of the telescope to put that light into the other instrument later. But we don't want to throw away photons. And so we, we share fields of view. So if you think of this big, long field of view, what it is is you cookie-cutter out little pieces of field of view for the different instruments. 
The workhorse will be the near-infrared camera, but there's also a near-infrared spectrometer, which has a unique new technology. It has a multi-slit array, MEMS technology, that allows us to dynamically open and close slits so that when it goes to a particular part of the sky, it says, oh, we know that there's a hundred different stars out there, and we want to look at the a slit spectrometer on each one of them, so we'll open the slits that line up with those stars, close all the others, and, and actually can do slit spectroscopy on a hundred objects with the same image. Down here, the fine guidance sensor and the nearest, which are down here, those are used to stabilize the image. So any sort of residual vibration within the observatory, slight motion that's moving us around and trying to not point us directly at the sky, we will use the fine guide sensor. It will look at a star, feed a feedback loop to something called the fat fine steering gear that's in the telescope to stabilize the image. A lot of new te technology in, in cameras are using image stabilization. We've been doing that for years, and Ball actually has got a big reputation for fast steering gears. <laughs> for but we will be stabilizing that to incredibly tight tolerances. So how does this compare back with Hubble, James Webb, and Spitzer? Spitzer was fairly small in aperture size, but it was big in field of view. Hubble, about yay, yay. James Webb will have roughly the same size of field of views, typically for most of the instruments, maybe a little bit bigger for near cam, a little bit smaller for uh, near you, but much bigger aperture. So down here it just sort of summarizes the width of this is relative to how big the aperture is. This is showing what colors we're looking at. So we are spanning the UV, you know, we will not get down into the ultraviolet and visible of Hubble, but we'll pick up the upper end of Hubble, we'll overlap them, and we'll go out and then we'll overlap the very long wavelengths of Spitzer. And we'll have a much more sensitivity than either one of those. So the system hierarchy, well, we build this thing, and we launch it, it's, it's an international effort, so, it, so we're doing this with the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. And part of the European contribution is that we will launch on an Ariane uh, vehicle out of the ESA's launch facility in French Guiana, which is just, it's on the coast just above Brazil in South America. So uh, it will launch out of there on an Ariane. The observatory segment is being built basically through Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, and it comes down, the, the prime contractor under Goddard is Northrop Grumman. We're, we're a teammate with Northrop Grumman and uh, Ex uh, Excellus. I have trouble when it started out as Kodak. Ball's the only one that hasn't changed his name. It started out with Kodak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the near cam is built in the U.S. MIRI is a half and half. The optics is built by the Europeans, but the focal plane and the cryo cooler to cool it is detector even colder than what we can get at of it is being done by the U.S. Near spec is done by the Europeans, and the Canadians are doing the fine guidance. Well, that telescope is so big that there's no launch vehicle that allows us to build the full observatory, the full telescope exactly the way we're going to use it and test it on the ground like that. There's no launch vehicle big enough. So we have to figure out how to build a telescope on the ground and test it, verify it, to convince ourselves that we can build it that way. But parts of it have to be broken, folded up, so we can fit it inside the telescope and launch it. Then it will remotely spread out, pull down again, and we then have to bring it into performance. And that, by the way, is the primary, primary responsibility for all aerospace. So solar array deploys the high beam antenna. This is just uh, shows some intermediate work where it's doing some mid-course correction burns over the thrusters. Then the high beam antenna deploys. 
Then the thrusters fire again and it, it rotates back. Now the sun shield starts unfolding. The basic unitized pallet structure, that's what UPS stands for, comes down. Then the covers that are on the sun shield that are in those, well, the, the telescope deploys up. Then the covers on the sun shield come off, the membrane covers. So you'll see those peel back off those surfaces. Then the sun shield starts spreading out. <clears throat> Once it's spread out, then it has to be, you have to fl flare the five layers apart because they have to be flared at an angle so that they radiate the heat out to the side. Then, so you got to fluff the blanket. Yeah, <laughs> you got to fluff the blanket. <laughs> <coughs> Then we finally start deploying. There's a small, it doesn't show up here, but there's a little radio. Now we deploy the secondary mirror. It comes out. And then we bring the wings around so that we have the full telescope. But the individual segments on that telescope are still only to within a millimeter. A millimeter is pretty close, but not good enough optically. We've got to get down another factor of a, a million well, closer. So we go through something called the wavefront sensing and control process. I'll talk about that a little bit. So anyway, it's a team effort. Ball is responsible, we were responsible for the optical design and all the optics. We're also <coughs> responsible for the large cooler radiator that cools all the science instruments up on here. And there's <coughs> The, the real thing is we're responsible for the brains to figure out how to sense and control and realign everything after it's in flight and keep it updated on a, on a regular basis. And we will also be supporting part of the integration test, even though Excellus has the, the major responsibility for that. So let me get on to then the magic is in the active control of these mirrors. The fact that we can actively adjust them on orbit. So how do we do that? Well, the first is the primary mirror segments themselves. They each have six degrees of freedom. In other words, we can tip, tilt, rotate, push them up and down sideways. And then additionally, there's an ability to change the curvature of each one. We can push in the center relative to the edges to change the curvature so that we can match them all to each other so that they all look identical. The secondary mirror, it's got its six degrees of freedom to align it to make sure we've got it aligned correctly. And then we have the app optic system. So it goes in. One of the things that I did mention in the back there, and I'm getting very De too detailed for some of you, but the, some of you who are real operators realize that there's something called the A omega or the aton due on telescopes. If you take the area of the aperture and the size of the field of view, those two, the product, that's the area times the solid angle. If that starts getting too big, you can't build it to have good optical performance over the whole field of view with a two-mirror system. Hubble is just about at the limit of a two-mirror system. James Webb, our aperture is so much bigger, we can't. So we have to add a third mirror called a field mirror. And what it does is the beam from the first two, the Cassegrain telescope, feeds onto different parts of that tertiary depending on where you are in the field. And the different parts of the tertiary can correct the aberrations, so that when we get all said and done, now it looks like we've got good optical performance over a big field of view, even though we're using this humongous primary view. The integrated science instrument, I've already talked a lot about all the different instruments in there, so let me move on. The layout of the telescope, light comes in from the left, parallel collimated light coming from some distant star, strikes the primary mirror, goes to the secondary mirror, then it goes to the Cassegrain focus. That would be the focus of just the primary and secondary if we were to use it. But 
as I just mentioned, there's a fair bit of aberration over wide fields of view at that point. So it feeds on to the tertiary. The tertiary applies the field correction. Then it comes up, and we don't want to build a bunch of science instruments and block all of our primary mirror, so we use a small fold mirror, which also is used to stabilize the image. So that's the fine steering mirror. And it finally goes back here, and here's the focal surface for the telescope. And what we do there is we put a pickoff mirror for each of the individual instruments. So each instrument can pick up its portion of the field and then relay it on through its own objects to its own focal point. Now, to show you the relative sizes of all those mirrors, you saw before the woman standing by the full James Webb. But if you look at, here's one of the 18 segments compared to the size of the secondary, compared to the tertiary, and then finally, you know, the FS sandwiches. So, what's the magic? The magic is how we build these mirrors. We start off with this substrate, very lightweight, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's a beryllium mirror substrate. Then, to hold that substrate, but to not put stress into it, we've got to gently hold it in several places. So there's actually three uh, what are called whipples. You know, like the whipples for hitching your plow to your horses. Uh, that go in through there. And then, those whipples, are attached, each, each of these three whipples are attached to these actuators. There's two. There's one, two, and they come in at an angle. Two more up on that whipple, and two more on this whipple. And that gives us what's called a hexapod configuration. And by changing the length, each of those six actuators, by uniquely changing the lengths of them, we, in effect, can move that mirror in the six degrees of freedom that we want. We could slide it sideways, this way, that way, up and down, or we can tilt it, tilt it, or rotate it. The actuators have to react against something. You know, they, you know they're lifting and pushing that mirror, but what's, from what? They've got to be on ground. Okay, the ground is this large delta frame. The delta frame mounts by flexures to the integrating back plane. There's this large back plane that holds all 18 PMSAs. And that back plane mounts with these flexures. And for the purposes of handling a single mirror, we have a ground support equipment, this triangle that's the handling ring. But think of it as being sort of a surrogate for oh, the back plane. So it, the flexure mounts to that handling ring the same way it would mount to the back plane. Now, the radius of curvature that I mentioned. We've got these six strong backs that come out to the corner of each mirror, and they come up to this area right here. And what we have is we have an actuator between this point, and it goes down through and presses on the substrate. And so it can push on the center of the substrate relative to the six corners, or it can pull. So it can effectively flatten the mirror out, or make it more concave. But the idea there is so that we can make all 18 max, so that their curvature matches, so that now when you align them in rigid body to each other, you also have the curvatures match, so that they look like they're this single big six and a half meter curved surface. <clears throat> well, magic in the mirrors and the fact that you go through a learning curve. People worry about how much it costs or anything else. I like to show this one just that when we did the engineering development unit, is you're polishing, you, you polish, you measure, you polish, you measure. Each time you measure, you figure out where you need to polish. And you talk about how many times do you have to do that, how many iterations, how many repeats to finally get a good mirror. And what you can see is in the engineering development unit, it took almost 70 iterations to finally get to where we need to meet the requirements. But part of that was because it was the first one, and we were learning. So then when we built the first batch of six of flight mirrors, they came down in here. We were quite a bit faster. The second batch, even faster yet. And the third batch, when we came down here, we were twice as fast as we were for the engineering mode. It just shows that if you, if you 
really manage your system carefully and make sure you learn from it, you, you improve. So, so now we know how to build years and we know how to build fast. <laughs> Well, building these mirrors was a, it was a big story in itself. Uh, actually, I don't show the mine in Utah that gets the original ore from which they, they refine the beryllium. It starts out with the beryllium uh, in Elmore, Oklahoma, a Bryce Wellman. And they made the blanks, the beryllium blanks, and sent them down to Axis Technologies in Coleman, Alabama. Then, from there, they machined the blanks down to nominally a lightweighted mirror, which then went out to Tinsley to be rough polished. From there, it goes to Ball. We look, we do measurements on that, and we start integrating it and adding extra features, you know, these whipples and all this other stuff. Then it goes down to Huntsville, Alabama, to their large facility where they can measure, where we measure six at a time in their cryo, because we need to measure them at the cryogenic temperatures. Then they come back to Ball, we deintegrate them, send them back out so that Tansley can do the fine polishing that makes the corrections that we got from the cryo measurements. Then they go back to, to Ball. Then we add measuring it, and then we send them off to QCI, uh, just outside in New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia, to have the gold reflective coatings put on them. Then they come back to Ball for measurements, and we then add the final additional, you know, the extra motors and everything else that go on it, and send it for the final test to be done at cryogenic to show that they do in fact meet requirements. Then they came back to Ball. We do a few things. We refurbish some motors by having and finally shipped them to Goddard so that they did integrate the trucks. So they've made 12 trips essentially across the nation. However, they'll make a trip from Goddard down to Houston for the testing, then out to be integrated with the spacecraft in California by barge down through the Panama Canal to Peru. So we still got a lot of traveling to do but none of it matches the 1.5 million miles out to L2 and then going around L2 for 10 years. So it's good, they're going to travel a lot further. Yeah. So Brush Wellman, like I say, they take the, the beryllium, they, they vaporize it, make very fine spherical powder, and then they do something called hot isostatic press. So they press that powder together. But what that does is the beryllium crystals themselves are isotropic, they have a preferred direction. But if you make very tiny spheres that are randomly oriented and press them together, that centered or, or hot isostatic pressed material now acts uniform and isotropic. So now when it cools down or heats up, it expands nice and uniformly, which is what we want from here. Well, we sent it to Axis. What's interesting at Axis is they start out with 250 kilograms in, in the blank. And by the time they have cut this lightweighted, this isogrid, they take all this stuff, they have removed 92% of the mass. So 92% of their machine chips that fall on the floor of beryllium actually get sent back to Brush Moment to be recycled as more beryllium. Then it gets out to Tinsley where they do the polishing. And I've already mentioned all the different patterns there. What's, as I mentioned though, what's the magic in the mirrors isn't just the fact we polish these exquisitely polished mirrors, but it's also all of this active control that goes into the back. This just shows the actuators, it shows the technicians working on the back of one side here. So again, you get this size of scale. This is just one segment. The secondary mirror has its own magic, again, as I've already mentioned with the actuators. Uh, and this happens to show the you'll see a little bit. All these mirrors chipping back and forth across the country. Boy, you don't want to take a risk with it. So every mirror has its own shipping container. We see it being lowered down here very carefully. It's a hermetically sealed, purged. It's got accelerometers in it, so when it's shipped across the nation, we know exactly 
how strong each bump would be. <laughs> well, I'm getting carried <laughs> away. But to make sure that the trucks don't hit any bumps that would cause any damage to anything. So, uh, so there's a lot of care that goes into these mirrors. Now, I've already mentioned the field-dependent optical performance using the tertiary mirror and how that fits into, quote, the aft optics pitch. Now, those aren't active. Those are fixed. Those are aligned before flight and they need to stay put. So they're aligned in this aft optics bench. There's the tertiary reflecting back down to the FSA. This is an interesting picture because it's looking through this aperture that the light goes into the aft optics. We're looking in there, and it looks like you see the FSM. So I, but I said that the FSM, this is sort of an upside down picture, the FSM would be right there. And yet I'm seeing it in there. No, what you're seeing is there's the tertiary mirror and you're seeing the image of the FSM reflected in the tertiary Well, the mirrors are done and they're ready for integration. And how good are they? Well, all of them, we've gotten down to numbers like less than 25 on the primary mirror. The others, less than 20 nanometers RMS. Let me just tell you, the human hair is between 50 to 100 microns. So we've got this smooth to a thousandth of a human hair. And in fact, if you took the size of one of these segments and the fact that it is the primary mirror has curvature to it, the radius of curvature of that segment and the size of the segment is in the same proportion as the size of Colorado to the radius of the Earth. And so how flat would Colorado <coughs> have to be to be as good as these mirrors. Well, we would keep some civil engineers and big construction companies busy because we would have to take 14,000 foot peaks, bulldoze them down, level out Colorado, fill up all the valleys until Colorado was 6,800 feet elevation and the maximum peak to valley would be 10 inches. <laughs> So this just shows the 18 segments, each in their individual little careful shipping container, ready you know, for the shipping. And this is how they would then ship the car. So the final magic comes together in the wavefront sensing and control process. When this thing finally gets deployed, those 18 segments, they're good to millimeters, but that isn't good enough to give us good optical energy. But it is roughly such that a single segment is roughly aligned with the secondary mirror in the pathologic system. That it would act like its own little one and a half meter telescope and create an image. But it's not in best focus and it might have a little bit of tilt, have a little bit of vibration. But what we will get on the focal plane will be these 18 lousy images, each one from an individual segment. So then, by doing a, se a secondary mirror focus sweep, we can sort of find what's the average of all those as far as focus, sort of get an average focus just to help improve the stuff as we move forward. Then we go through, and unfortunately it isn't showing up, but we'll take a series of images. You'll move one segment, take an image, move another, and see which spot moved. Now we know which spot goes with which segment, and we know how to, and where it is on the focal plane. So we figure out how to tilt that segment, and we can form them all into an array. And for convenience, it's nice to put them into an array that matches the way they are on the focal, the way they are on the primary mirror. So we'll know which spot goes with which mirror. That's just a matter of convenience. But we'll use that to then go to the course alignment process for the, for the global alignment. And this is how we will then get the global alignment of the secondary to all 18 segments acting together as a primary mirror and getting them aligned to the aft optics system. That'll be coarse. It'll do the coarse phasing. We have a, a unique little instrument called the DHS, the first carbon, and that will look at each mirror edge relative to its neighbor and figure out what has to be done to lift or lower to get it to match its neighbor. And then by stitching them all together, we get a better telescope. And finally, once we get it almost, we'll go to something called phase retrieval. And that allows us to just doing nothing but looking at images of a star and then using little weak lenses in the near cam that will give us a defocused image one way 
uh, defocused image the other way. From that information, you can use this, these software, these algorithms, and figure out what is the phase error in the telescope and figure out how we need to move each mirror to get it so we finally meet the diffraction limit of performance. We have demonstrated all this with a roughly a one-seventh scale simulator of the, tele of the telescope. We, we built it all. It's got all 18 segments, the secondary mirror, the tertiary, uh, it's, and, and the same hexapod motors with the same sensitivity for how much they move when we give them commands. And we've gone through and been able to demonstrate this whole wavefront sensing and control process using a physical model. We also have built up computer simulated models, some called the integrated telescope model, uh, for doing the simulations and verifying. Finally, I'll just mention it, it is a big project. There's probably 3,000 people who have had their fingers on James Webb at some time or other. This just shows, though, that we and we're getting ready for one here next month. But roughly once a year now, from early on, we have long, we have what these these partners workshops, and these are representatives from all the different groups working on it, from the whole international community that's working on it, and we have it at different places they're working. And the Irish are part of the European Consortium, and so one of the meetings we had in Dublin. <laughs> and this shows the, the group. And this is a full-scale mock-up of what the telescope, the telescope looks like. So it gives you, again, that sense of scale. So, with that, I will finish. I'm just saying, <laughs> this is fun. Engineering is exciting. Oh, the color didn't come out. And astronomy is the you know, we use astronomy as the alibi of why we were coming off the <laughs> Yeah, somehow the, the projector didn't like the red. Yeah. So so I thank you. And if you have any questions.
Uh, now, the actual launch date you know, is, is tricky. You know, launch windows, you know, what launch windows for, for hitting the right orbit to be able to get out to L2. Uh, you know, so so there will be some adjustment of that. But basically, uh, sometime around Halloween 18. Is so within the next decade, we'll probably be able to see the other planets where there's life on them. Yeah, that, that's the plan. Uh, when it launches, it will take 107 days to get out to L2. When it launches, boy, they really give it a big throw. You know, Apollo took like three days to get to the moon. This will pass the moon at the end of the first day. It is zipping. But it zips, goes on out there, and as it gets out there, it slows down, slow, finally goes in. And it'll actually be in an orbit around the L2. So, so as the L2 goes with the Earth around the Sun, it will be going a little bit ahead and then getting back behind. And the reason for doing that is because I, I, I in the past I thought that the L2 is a it's called a saddle point. It's not totally stable. If it's if you start getting ahead, it's stable in the sense that it wants to pull it back and block it to the same speed as the Earth. And if it gets behind, Pulls it forward. So it gets up the pommel, it gets pulled back into the saddle. If it slides back on the cannon, it gets pulled back into the saddle. However, if you slide off to a stirrup, it can fall out. If you slide off to this stirrup, it can fall out. So it does take active station keeping. So there will be uh, a certain amount of station keeping burns that will be done to keep, keep that orbit centered on the saddle. And you minimize the amount of fuel you have to use over 10 years to stay in the saddle if you use this, this halo or this tube orbit, as opposed to trying to stay exactly in the center of the saddle. So how, long is the, how long is the uh, focusing period going to take? Uh, how long is the focusing period going to take? It'll probably be a, a, a couple of months, but part of that is because it takes a long time for the whole spacecraft to cool down. So, for example, NIRCAM won't get cold enough to start using the, de the detectors on NIRCAM until about 60 days into after launch. And then there will be a period of time that uh, we'll be doing this commissioning process. Once it's commissioned, we work on a 14-day cadence. In other words, if there's anything that's causing slight changes in the observatory, the requirement is we have to meet our requirement. Once we set it, we have to be able to meet the requirements for at least 14 days. And then the ground ops folks have a requirement that they must be able to update it at least every 14 days. And so right now the plan is there will actually be a wavefront sensing visit you know, every few days just to monitor what the wavefront looks like with the anticipation that then every 14 days they can upload a tweak or an adjustment if necessary to do it. Let me jump in yeah, real okay. quick. I mean, the kids have been saying the choir very, very long well for about an hour now. So we will have volunteers at the telescopes. It seems to be somewhat clear to the south so we can see some stuff. So anybody who wants to go look through a telescope either goes to that door or to that door. And everybody else can stay and ask questions.